the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. Here we go, episode 231, The Candy Store, part of the Wise Guys series, as we have emphasis on the Lucchese crime family. Today we're going to talk about not only the candy store, but the actual neighborhood, which was known as Corona Queens. And we're going to also speak about the person responsible for all this, His name was Joe Brown, better known as Joe Lucchese. Now, there's a lot of information that you won't find on Joe Lucchese. And it just goes to show you how low profile a lot of these guys were in the old days. And even to find a picture of them. There's like one vague picture that that I came across in in my research. So definitely he wasn't uh, like his brother, which there's a lot of information on. Of course, his brother was Thomas Lucchese, which was the actual boss, underboss for 22 years, and then became the boss in 1951 to 1967. He... And we'll get more into Brother Joe. How do you get in contact with us? Well, it's real easy. RaiderCop.com takes you to our official auto streaming website where you can hear all our episodes from number 1 to 231. And Raider Cop Nation is our official website. You can get more information on upcoming shows and more about us. What do you hear the web? The podcast, wherever you get your podcast, you can find the Stay Out Raider Cop podcast. Social media, we always say we're not part of the little bird, which is Twitter, nor Limpkin, but everything else is pretty much fair game. Raider Cop, Raider Cop Nation, Raider Cop Podcast, you can find us. So, we're going to do the three segments again of living in the Bolshevik states of woke. And it's kind of hard now to limit it to three. I mean, I am for the sake of time. But when, you know, uh, the way I do it is I plug it into this website that gives you the information based on the criteria that you give it. And... The excessive amounts of stories we've got on this goof in the White House is just overwhelming. Of course, you can only get the real truth on what's happening in the White House through conservative news, because if you listen to um, regular news, you're going to get the Bolshevik line. And uh, he's doing a great job. He's such a leader. Meanwhile, he's drooling all over himself. So we're going to keep it to three. But boy, can if, if I have to tell you, I can go much more than three. And uh, we're in the month of July. I'll go over at the end of the podcast. I'll go over the, um, the lineup for July. And we're still on two episodes a week, launching Sunday and Wednesday, and uh, we will continue with the Wise Guys series, two stories every month, firearms series, two stories every month, and uh, AWOL series, two episodes a month as on that, and then the daily, day of daily operations of law enforcement, two stories on that. And so we're going to be busy every month, but busy is good. And all we want is for you to gain knowledge. No way to sit there and say, I heard 45 minutes to an hour of this episode 
and I got nothing out of it. No, nope. you'll get some information. You'll take something away from every one of our episodes. So without any further holdup, let's go to the living in the Bolshevik states of woke. The Soviet Union will be pleased to offer amnesty to your wayward vassal. The Soviet Union? I thought you guys broke up. Yes, that's what we wanted you to think. <laughs> And our first story takes us to a story that not even the village idiot can believe. Dems are blaming Republicans on defunding the police. That's right. The new caper now is the three-card Monty, as the Democrats are now telling the media, oh, no, you got this all wrong. The party that's trying to defund the police is the Republicans. And they're specifically pointing to the catastrophe in the infrastructure bill. That's about $6 trillion because they won't vote for that because there's a little line on there that says we'll send money to police departments and they can do whatever they need to do. And because they said no to the entire bill, they're defunding police. Nobody, nobody, not even the village idiot can believe the balls on the Democratic Party. This is why they'll lose the House, the Senate, and in 2024, the presidency. Our second story takes us to whispering Joe Hamonero Biden. For those of you that want to know what Hamonero means, it's Cuban slang for one that's touchy-feely in a sick, sinister form. Hamonero. And again, the new And it's eerie, bugging the crap out of even the media that's pointing this out. It's disturbing, but apparently the goof is getting worse. And our last story takes us to the New York Times, which has come out and said that Camilla should be given easier task than what they're calling impossible problems. And no doubt it is a direct reflection of what happened at the border. Now, the article goes on to say that the New York Times columnist uh, Ezra Klein feels President Biden is making life too difficult for Vice President Kamala Harris and feels that she should be given simpler tasks to enhance her reputation. But critics on both sides quickly found problems with this argument. Kamala Harris will probably be the Democrat nominee in, in 2024 and 2028. <laughs> Biden's team should be given her portfolios that make it like, like her uh, she'll win. Instead, they're giving her impossible problems that will likely become liabilities. This is mind-boggling how the liberals were all caught up in a room trying to figure out how to justify this effing catastrophe in the White House. There you have it, folks. The three stories of this week of the catastrophe in the White House. We are keeping with our segments that after we tell you the bad news, it's time for a joke. So let's break that joke in for you. I just got back from a pleasure trip. I took my mother-in-law to the airport. You got to admit, they're starting to get to you. You're starting to really like them. Okay. Now it's time for the word of the week. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. The book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. 
and you can get more on the information from RaiderCopNation.com. There's a section on there that tells you about upcoming shows. Hit that um, browser, and um, the website will drop down, and you'll see a selection. It'll say A Wall. Click on that, and it'll take you to all kinds of episodes with uh, the Word of God. Today's episode 231, The Candy Store, we will be talking about The Candy Store, how important it was to organize crime. We're going to be talking about a specific community, Corona Queens, and we're going to be talking about a specific mobster that was named Joe Brown. He was the brother of Tommy Brown, or Thomas Brown, and his brother, Tommy Brown, was the boss of the Lucchese crime family. Very little information on Joe Lucchese, better known as Mr. Joe Brown. And it's just tributing, it just indicates how underneath the radar, the old school gangsters really portrayed themselves. That you, they would just, you wouldn't even know they existed. Of course, back then there was no social media like there is today. So it made it a lot easier. So it's time to get the short bus and listen to our main topic, the candy store, on uh, part of the Wise Guy series on episode 231. <laughs> Episode 231, The Candy Store. Today we're going to talk about Joe Lucchese. And his nickname was a.k.a. Mr. Brown or Joe Brown. Of course, the name of Mr. Brown comes from his brother, his older brother, which was the boss, and well, first the underboss and then the boss of the Lucchese crime family, Thomas Lucchese. On an arrest, I believe in the 1920s, a New York City police detective nicknamed Tommy Lucchese, Three Fingers Brown, from naming him after a major league pitcher, I believe with the uh, Chicago Cubs, that had three fingers. Now, as you know, we discussed this before in another podcast, Tommy Lucchese lost two fingers, thumb and index finger in an accident when he was younger, about 16 years old, working at a manufacturing plant. And so here he is now getting arrested and the detective uh, wanted to be funny about it and called him Three Fingers Brown and the name stuck. Of course, the name would trickle down to the rest of the siblings and Mr. Joe Brown was born too. Now, Of course, the brothers follow the older brother into organized crime. Just to recap on Tommy Lucchese, a founding member in, let's say, our date is always 1931. That's when we start our calendar in organized crime. We can go farther back. Tommy Lucchese was a part of pre-organized crime as we know it. And... When the Gargalargo family started, Lucky Luciano had appointed each boss and they would in turn pick their underboss. Thomas Lucchese was picked to be the underboss. 22 years he served as the underboss of the Gargalargo family. Now, he was so loyal because he was the front boss, the real boss of the organization the first 22 years 
didn't really trust the other bosses or the commission, so he went underneath the radar, wasn't even seen much in the street, and the, the face to the, of his operation was Tommy Lucchese. He was well respected amongst the ranks, and in 1951, he stepped into the position of leader or boss of what was the Gugliano family, now would become the Lucchese family. His brothers would follow him into organized crime, some as made men, some as associates, and brothers being, of course, Vincent, which was better known on the street as Jimmy, and Auntie Onino, and of course, uh, Giuseppe, which was Joe. Joe would become a made member of Costa Nostra, and sometime early on, he would be appointed a capo regime by his brother. And although it was sanctioned by the other boss when it was the Gagliago family, but they had an idea what they wanted to do with Joe. They wanted Joe to run gambling operations. It was a steady source of income that the Lucchese family desperately needed, all families needed. It was much larger than it is today. And they also wanted to take over a given area that was progressively becoming more and more Italian. Now, this is important for the survival of Costa Nostra because you have to have a pool where to pick new members from. So starting a, I don't know, uh, an organized crime family in the middle of uh, Waco, Texas, you're not going to have a big pool of Italian-Americans that you can start your family. Or let's see it as a baseball franchise or a farm team. So you need a pool to pick from. Lucchese, Tommy Lucchese, picked Corona. His family had moved from East New York to the suburbs of Queens in Corona, which was a growing Italian community. He picked his brother Joe to run or become a capo regime in that neighborhood and run the rackets. Pretty much that's what he was there, allowing him to go under the radar. He wasn't uh, any one of those movie gangster celebrities uh, rubbing elbows with the rich and famous. He was in a small community at the time in Corona, making millions on gambling, shylocking, and basic racketeering. His operation, of course, would grow and to enormous amounts of men and money. The old, um, his older brother would, of course, Three Fingers Brown would become boss, and life for Joe would be a lot easier. Now, it was always comfortable. It's a comfortable landing because when Tommy was under boss, he basically had full run of the organization because he was the front boss, as we've said before. He met with other families, Tommy did. He met with uh, the rank and file of the family. So he was regarded and well-respected in the street. So when he made his brother and then put him in a position of copper regime of Corona, not too many people were gonna argue that position. Soon after, Joe would become a, a cop under his brother Tommy. He would control operations such as... Uh, now, the operations that they had in, in Corona were not as big and lucrative as you might have in uh, Manhattan or some other places, but they did have some similarities. In the area of Corona, they would concentrate on closing manufacturers. Now, the Lucchese's were big on the garment district. Tommy Lucchese specifically moved in on the garment district. 
He was the principal in organized crime. Today, there are other families like Gambino and so forth, and everybody pounds themselves on the chest. This is, look what we've done. But it attributed directly to Tommy Lucchese that he was the principal in that racket. And a lot of the operation on transporting trucking would be transported from the garment district in Manhattan into warehouses in Corona, Queens, because the airports were being developed nearby, which are currently today LaGuardia Airport and JFK. Of course, early on, they weren't known as that. And uh, that was the beginning of how Joe, underneath the radar, was working with other avenues in the Lucchese family and in this specific in the dis- in the garment district. He also ran junkyards, scrap yards, which were big money back then, and they still are today. And uh, the control of the two airports were coming. Of course, John F. Kennedy Airport originally opened up in 1948. It was known as Idle Wild Airport, changing its name in December 24th, 1963, in honor of President John F. Kennedy after his assassination. And LaGuardia Airport, which was originally known as the New York Municipal Airport, it would change its name on June 1st, 1947, in honor of Mayor uh, Florencio LaGuardia, which was mayor of New York from 1934 to 1945, an instrumental in the development of those airports. So, Joe, Mr. Uh, Mr. Brown, as he was known, had a bigger stake and bigger responsibilities. But he was more the eyes and ears for his brother. Of course, there were other people that were going to run the unions and, and, and do various other rackets as regard to those industries. But everybody had to check in with Mr. Brown, and the candy store would be the center of operations. He would also, as I said, control the numbers game. In one example, one of his made men that became a very big high roller at the time was a guy by the name of Francesco Frankie Bells Campanello. And... Uh, the New York City Police Department would arrest him various times on gambling operations. He was controlling a lot of the operations for uh, Joe Lucchese. And a lot of the gambling operations that they had were becoming so large and so many people were involved. There were up to a 60 uh bookie shops they had and uh, you had to employ a lot of people, you had to count a lot of money, you had a lot of responsibility and the businesses that came with the gambling operations such as Loan Shark and so forth it started to grow and grow and grow Joe's power in the area of Corona Queens started to becoming more and more developed and more and more of a responsibility He would later on, one of his men would get promoted to Capo 2. They would be known as the two Joes, just like they were the two Tommies. Tommy Gagliano, which was boss prior to Lucchese, and Tommy Lucchese. Their roles in gambling operations would become big earners for the Lucchese crime family. The headquarters, of course, would be out of Corona and the candy store. They also had areas of Jackson Heights, Elmhurst, Forest Hills, Regal Park, Woodside, Sunnyside, Ridgewood, Massfit, Flushing, College Point, Bayside, Whitestone, and Melba. So they controlled a lot of Northern Queens, Mr. Joe Brown, and his copper regime is getting bigger and with more responsibility. By the 1940s 
end of uh, after the war from 45 to 50, the New York City Police Department was saying that his gambling operation was netting the Lucchese crime family about $15 million a year. He would eventually get help from his brother in having one of his men get promoted to capo to assist Mr. Brown, Joe Lucchese, and that would become Joe Narrow Loratro. He came in and now he would take the gambling operation to a higher level. He was one of uh, Joe's uh, made men or soldiers that was more into the gambling operation. He was an earner, and he definitely produced much more money. 1963, Joe the Snitch Valachi would name Joe as a capo and name him as the King of Corona. He identified him to the Senate Committee. Joe Valachi did as being a copper regime under his brother's organization, Tommy Lucchese, and he referred to him as the King of Corona. And there's a new art, news article I want to read that came out in 1961, and it deals with Frank Campanello, and it's, it's a clipping from that era to get a little gist of what they were dealing with back then. So his first article would be 1938. It's just a small article. It says, Counterman held on gun charges, Frank Campanello, 32, of 103 18 Corona Avenue, was discharged on a bookmaking charge yesterday by Magistrate Anthony Servarsi in Ridgewood Felony Court for lack of evidence. Campanello was arrested July 5th by Patrolman William Lambert and the Office of the Chief Inspector of the Police Department in front of a dwelling at 6903 Woodside Avenue in Woodside. So this is 1938, and of course the charges were dropped. So what I'm pointing at is this was common. So they'd get pinched, and they had everybody brought, so eventually they would drop it. So there was no masquerading that they were gangsters and that's what they were doing. But every now and then we needed an arrest. And guys like Campanello were the ones that got chosen for that. Some other articles. This is a, a New York City Police Intelligence Bulletin that identifies uh, Frank Campanello, also known as Frankie Bell, FBI number 62228 was operating independently for years, was the biggest bookie in Queens. Went on to say that Campanella was still operative, operating a bookie with La Rattro, consistent with the ultimate, uh, ultimately Lucchese consent. As a result, the Lucchese faction gets a good piece of Campanello's actions. So back then, this police report believed that Frank Campanella was independent in paying tax, but that wasn't the case. He was a made member of the Lucchese family, and uh, he was a part of the family. So an indication of how the police department um, were slow to to learn a lot of information. It goes on to say the police department, and it gives a... Thomas Lucchese also operates in this group. They identify Tommy Lucchese under B, uh, B number 485791. That was some report number that they had for him. And uh, uh, Campanello, they go on to say, is considered uh, to be a bag man for the Queen's gambling element headed by Joseph Lucchese. So... They're putting it all together. This is early on, probably 1940s. They're putting it all together. And uh, some of it is hit or miss, of course. And lastly, I want to read to you. Now, this newspaper article would be probably sometime in the early 40s, 41, 42, something similar to that. It describes Campanello. And it's a simple, small article. It says, four held Two dismissed in bookie case, four men arrested in Northern Queens on bookmaking charges were held in bail for a hearing. Two others 
were discharged yesterday in Queens Felony Court. Um, then it goes on to describe everybody that was arrested and where they lived and all that. But most importantly, when you get down to the bottom, it says uh, held in a $500 bail each. Remember, this is back in the early 40s. $500 of bail each in the hearing for Thursday. Albert Bunsen, 40, of 1934 University Avenue, the Bronx. These are the people that were also arrested. Andrew Barron, 33, of West 48th Street, Manhattan. And Frank Campanello, 35, at 4907 104th Street in Corona. Now, the reason that this address is so important is because this is the address of the candy store. So we're going to dive into the candy store. My information on the candy store is limited. You don't really have a lot of articles or anything to point to. But as it would have it, I would meet a gentleman when I, in the early 80s, I came down from New York City to Miami, 1984. And several years later, after going to one job, to this job, to that job, I would end up working for a famous hotel in Miami Beach in the area of security. This is before I got into law enforcement. And during the time I was there, I was... I, I believe it was three days or four, four days, not sure, that we had orientation before you got put in your employment role. So during the orientation center uh, segment, you would have maybe 10, 14 people. I can't remember the exact amount of people that were with me. This was our orientation group. They take you on tours. You fill out forms. You go to personnel to show you the cafeteria and all this baloney for three or four days, whatever it was, and then you were sent out. So we were, uh, on, the, on day one, we were going through our applications and talking to the personnel representative, and at that time, the person had asked me, the representative, uh, that since I had an accent, where was I from? And I said I was from... New York from Queens so later on we went to lunch that first day one of the gentlemen that was in the orientation with me his name was Dino he said uh, you mind if I sit with you he also had a very thick New York accent and I said yeah sure I introduced myself he introduced he goes what part of Queens are you from and I now I lived on the border of Elmhurst and Corona. So I would always tell people Elmhurst, Corona. Now, of course, if you were from there, you were which one, Elmhurst or Corona? But I lived on the border. On 44th and Junction Boulevard was a divider. I could throw a rock either direction. So I, I told him, you know, Elmhurst, Corona. And he goes, well, you know, which one? And I go, well, here's where I lived. He goes, oh, man, I, I was born and raised there. And that was the beginning of me kicking it off with Dino. Now, to get a little bit on to Dino's issue, Dino was probably in his late 60s or mid 60s to late 60s, very uh, strong for his age. He had taken the position in this hotel as a bellman. And in talking to him, not that specific day, but years later, because we became very close. He had told me that he was a teamster in New York. And through that teamster affiliation, he had decided to relocate. And they told him, hey, they got in this famous hotel in Miami Beach, they got a teamster position as a bellman. So believe it or not, this hotel, the bellmen were teamsters. So Dino appeared uh, through the influence of the union, and he showed up there. Dino would go on to describe to me how it was to be born and raised 
in the Corona area. And he would tell me stories of the Lucchese crime family and how when he was young, they tried to recruit him and into the life to do certain things. And you know, first it was just runner, as a runner, go deliver this, go do that when he was a kid. And no harm, no foul. But again, when his father found out, he put a beating on him, like he would say, to keep away from, keep away from those guys. I told you that. So when Dino became of age, he would eventually uh, go into, I believe he told me, the Army. And he served in one of the wars. I can't remember if he told me in the Second World War or, or the Korean War. And when somebody came back from service, they offered him, again, a very lucrative position. But Dino just declined. But he, like he told me, you don't tell them no. You just tell them you rather not get involved in the life, which basically meant that whatever they need, he's there for them, but he doesn't want to get involved in the everyday responsibility of that. He wants to earn a living. They took care of him. Um, everybody in the neighborhood was taken care of. And he started to describe the candy store. The candy store would be located as we said, at 4907 104th Street in Corona. He would tell me it was a storefront, but right next door to the storefront was the entrance to the building that would take you upstairs to the apartments. Very similar to Gotti's situation with the Ravenite Social Club in Manhattan. They had the Social Club, and then they had these apartments upstairs. Well, the candy store was very similar. He also described to me that there was an area, there was one building and the other, the other building next to it, specifically the Lucchese crime family did not want them connected. They wanted a space in between both buildings and they would use that as an alleyway and a reference point to get in and out of the building through um elevator chutes that would go down to the basement area. It, for most people, it looked like a delivery was being done. So the truck would pull in, and you would think they were emptying, you know, merchandise into that portable elevator that would go down into the basement area. But most of the time, they were delivering sacks of money and things like that. And it was also a good route for a lot of guys I wanted to have meetings with Joe Lucchese and not get detected so easily by law enforcement through that alleyway. And I remembered all these stories and doing research for this podcast. I said, let me do a Google search and look up this address and see what it looks like. And lo and behold, when I saw it, I mean, it was exact description of what Dino had told me. Storefront next to it, the building that sent you upstairs. Then there was another storefront next to that. And then you got the alleyway and you can see in this Google map thing or Google Earth, whatever they call it, you can see the distinct separation of two buildings and a small alleyway. And that was done by the Lucchese crime family specifically for them to get through the neighborhood and they could walk through that building, go out through the other avenue, Corona Avenue, and disappear if law enforcement were keeping surveillances on them. So it was strategically done. Dina would go on to tell me that everything happened within that candy store in the confines in the back room was Joe Lucchese's office. And a lot of people would go there with neighborhood people with issues and problems where Mr. Brown would take care of those problems. He held court there Monday through Friday during business hours. Everybody knew uh, he held court there. Sometimes police surveillances would be out front. But it was a candy store where when kids get dismissed at 3 o'clock, they would go to the candy store. 
They would find candy so cheap that they'd come over and over again. Of course, the candy was so cheap because it wasn't really costing Joe Lucchese any money. And it did a public service. Back then, Costa Nostra wanted to be a part of the community, not against the community. Now, there are a lot of people that are going to tell you, well, you know, they're leeches of the community and all that. And they hurt a lot of people in the community, which is probably true. But they also wanted to be the authority of the community and gain the trust of the community. So they did a lot of favors for that community. Joe Lucchese would go on uh, ruling this empire of Corona for many years. His brother Thomas would die of brain cancer in uh, 1967. And Joe would hang on as a couple regime for several years after that. Later, he was brought down to soldier and he would just go into obscurity from there. He was, like all the Lucchese brothers, rich, affluent, and really did have the necessity to get his hands dirty. Nothing was really going to ever happen to him because he was regarded as Costa Nostra royalty just based on the last name alone. So he ruled with, as Dino said, with a fair hand. Everybody knew, don't cross any of these guys, but if you need something, they get you whatever you need. A lot of kids got in trouble. A lot of kids got arrested and got into trouble. Family members would end up going to the candy store, have their little sit down with Joe Brown, and all of a sudden those cases would be dropped. Dino told me he was one of those kids. He respected all of them, but he never got involved in the life. Dino told me a lot more stories that I'll continue as we discuss more of these individuals that dealt with specifically queens and corona queens. It, as an example of what I just said is, look what happened to Dino. He serves the military, he comes back, he's offered a job, of course, within the rank and file of organized crime. He declines it because he says, I can't do this on an everyday basis. I got to put food on the table. And uh, he respectfully, you know, doesn't take it. But he also says, whatever you guys need. And they give him a job that will serve him for the rest of his life. And that was working as a teamster first job Dino told me he had was he was a trucker and what did he do he'd pick up the garments in Manhattan in the garment district and he would bring them to the warehouses in Corona and also other duties he had was to move that those garments out of the warehouses in Corona and take them to the designated airports for shipping he did that until the late well, mid 80s and moved to Miami he became a widower he got remarried moved to Miami and that's how I met him a lot of people that got to know Dino like I did they didn't know Corona they didn't live in Queens they weren't born there they were Floridians and they thought that the old man was just full of it and go, he's always got a story some of the stories he's telling, there's no way you can, you know, believe it. But I was from New York. I was born there, and I did grow up in Corona. I never saw his stories as far-fetched. And today, they serve me for this episode. Interestingly enough, Corona, Queens, the area would be known as a mafia haven for Costa Nostra, areas that were 
or businesses that were located in that area were the Lemon Ice King of Corona, where they do Italian ice. Spaghetti Park, where they play bocce, still there today. And uh, the Parkside Restaurant, which is run by Tony Federici, which is known to be a retired capo in the Genovese crime family. They say retired, he's moved on, he's no longer, who knows, but that's what they say. And next to the candy store, which of course, the candy store doesn't exist no more. The location does, but the store doesn't. But next to it, that building that had to be separated from the candy store is Migliori Funeral Home. Now, Migliori would be, and I'm not saying that the funeral home is connected in any way today. It probably is a legitimate operation. But Miliorni is one of our episodes coming soon in the Wise Guys series with the Lucchese crime family. Joe would go on, as I said, into retirement, and eventually a lot of his people would also retire. And Corona now wasn't the Italian neighborhood. It was once a lot of... Hispanics would move into that neighborhood, specifically Dominicans. And the empire that the Lucchese crime family would start to die down as a result of that. Recently, there was a, there is a, one of these guys that has a YouTube channel that he was a made member of the Lucchese crime family. And you could, you know, ask them whatever questions and all that. So I post a question and I'll put it on the show notes and I'll try to find out exactly how many minutes it is into the, so you don't have to see the whole thing. But I asked him about the Lucchese crime family in Corona, Queens, and he squints and like my question came from planet Neptune and says, uh, nah, that's run by the West side and the West side meaning the Genovese crime family. And he mentions uh, Tori Federici, and which is true. I understand that. But the, one of the biggest families in that area that brought Corona up was the Lucchese crime family. He is a member of it. He's not sure. Uh, but this is typical of these made members that they have today. They don't know history. And... I seen him on another interview on YouTube while doing research where he was asked about the beginning of the Lucchese crime family when they're mentioning names. Me squinting. I don't know. I've never heard of anything. So he doesn't have any idea who these people are. And uh, it doesn't mean you need to. There's no orientation package when you get into the mafia and you become a made member. But for crying out loud, should you at least know what you're made of, what you are part of? Your history will determine your future, but it's up to you to find out these details. So in no way, shape, or form am I discrediting who he is and what he knows, but I'm pointing to the fact that made members today have nothing in comparison to have made members of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. None. They are from another planet. Specifically, he walked away from the life, became a rat snitch, whatever you want to call him, and now he's on YouTube, which is becoming a popularity. And we have an episode coming up in the future, which is called The Shelf, and we'll explain why all these uh, ex- mobsters are coming up on their YouTube channels and it has to do with the term shelving and the new commission rule on not killing anyone so as a result you become famous on YouTube I guess I don't know what to tell you Uh, the candy store would eventually close for business I don't know at what 
year, but most likely it was some time during the 70s, probably the late 70s. According to Dino, from inception, that place was open. It was a haven for Costa Nostra. From Thomas Lucchese himself going there to see his brother, to other bosses and other families, it is definitely a part of the history of Costa Nostra. And today, there still are candy stores that organized crime uses. Don't know how they use it today, but I know it is some type of front. In the era of Gotti, they would use candy stores as well. It's an easy way of laundering money, I suppose. But today, if you see that, it doesn't mean that they created it. It was created by their forebearers long, long time ago. So, the Wise Guys series, we will continue to bring you, remember, the Lucchese crime family for the duration of the year and giving you an idea of, of what it was to be a part of this Lucchese crime family. We've picked specific individuals that made the organization grow. We will continue doing these a series on the Lucchese crime family until the end of the probably in the beginning of the next year. Then we're going to switch over to the Genovese crime family. All right, so let me give you the lineup of July. Fast approaching, you blink twice, and the year is almost gone. Gone. Thank God, because we can't wait for a change in our government in 22. And we can't wait for a change in president in 24. July 4th, public records law, 232. It's about the phenomenon that's going on. I currently have 23 organizations that are out there. They go around bullying public places, bullying police, filming them, telling you they got a constitutional right to do whatever the hell they want. But who funds these people? Who trained them? Why are they connected to lawyers? How in the hell can you sit at home, do nothing, and play with a video camera all day? Who the hell pays your bills? We'll discuss that in public records for 232, July 4th. July 7th, the Black Brothers, we continue with the Wise Guy series. That's episode 233. We're going to talk about the Brothers Falco and their importance to the corona uh, area. July 11th, we go into the firearm series in episode 234, Wilson Combat WCP 320 Carry. And we'll talk about, is it good common sense to buy a $1,300 or $1,200 gun versus a $400 or $500 gun or $600 gun? We'll talk about that logic. And uh, July 18th, episode 236, To Whom Shall I Speak and Give Warning? We're going back into the AWOL series. July 21st, The Downfall of Portland. And that's episode, part of our Buccaneer series, part of uh, episode 237. Uh, Portland, Oregon has an 800 percent crime increase that's all you need to say 800 percent july 25th episode 238 he noticed the fig tree but remained hungry part of the awol series as well and rounding off the month of july with the wise guy series episode 239 a copper regime in the lucchese crime family his name was etori coco and why in the world was everybody scared of him in the Lucchese crime family, especially when Tommy Lucchese dies. He's in Florida, and everybody's shaking in their boots. We'll explain on uh, the remaining series of the Lucchese crime family. 
As always, it is my honor and pleasure to be your host on Radio Cop Podcast. Continue to pray for yourself because without you in the game, we have nothing. Continue to pray for your family, your community, for the law enforcement agencies that serve you. And most importantly, continue to pray for the United States of America. This is Alpha Mike, and I'm out. Thank you.